Thank you, uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, it may be handy, I'm not sure how well you can see if you're over to this side. Uh, if you would prefer, you certainly can move uh, over to your right a bit. All right, well, we are uh, doing a, I, what I'm doing is a summary of uh, a lot of the work that I've done over the years on Christianity, the relationship between Christianity and the American founding period, and then the continuing influence on uh, policy considerations uh, as we have seen them uh, develop. Uh, and the, the question is, to some extent, uh, how closely have in policy developments, whether it's foreign policy or public policy, whatever it is, how closely there has been a concern to follow along the same principles that the American founders relied upon because they understood the relationship between Christianity and the founding period. And uh, this is actually just a tiny sampling of the work that I've actually done. And I'm going to be going through and summarizing a number of related papers on this topic. But we could spend a whole lot more time here than what I'm actually planning to do. But I'll try to spare you too much grief and provide you with some useful information. All right, well, uh, the Christian principles of government have actually played a major role in understanding uh, the understanding of the foundations are the founders of the American political institutions, and we see this in, for example, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, the writings and speeching, speeches of the founders, among other sources, all of which I have read uh, a lot of volume after volume uh, on all of these things. And generally speaking, Christian principles of government include establishing a form of government that protects the God-given rights of man, remains limited to its proper sphere, and recognizes men as made in the image and likeness of God with the ability to reason and develop. And I've documented this in numerous studies, including papers on Christian principles of government, studies on the American founders and their ideas, studies on the formation of the Constitution, studies on the meaning of terms in the Constitution, studies on the Supreme Court interpretations of the Constitution, and studies on the current application of Christian principles of government, such as just war theory. Well, in this presentation, I'll be summarizing and reviewing my findings, as well as commenting upon current actions of federal government and government officials in regard to whether they have followed the views of the American founders and the consequences of these actions. First of all, a little study I did on John Witherspoon that included reading all of his writings, among other things. Well, probably no other individual had a greater direct impact on the thinking of the American founders than the Presbyterian minister, John Witherspoon, since he was professor to so many of them at the College of New Jersey, which later became Princeton University, including James Madison, whom we know as the father of the Constitution. John Witherspoon provided both biblical and natural law justifications for unlimited government, freedom of religion, necessity of checks and balances, and separation of powers. He argued that duties to God exceeded duties to man, enabling a concept, for example, of just revolution that undergirded the American Revolution. And he was very, very central in all points of the American Revolution, uh, also calling for humility before God by those uh, rather than sort of triumphalism on the American side. And clearly he provided a guiding light to the Continental Congress at every stage of the revolution, and uh, not a guiding light, but often sermons to which the entire Continental Congress uh, came and attended. Uh, anyway, fascinating fellow, and I don't have much time to spend on him because I've got so many others to cover. Well, how about religion under the Constitution as intended by the framers? So this was a study that uh, emphasized, you know, what the Constitution actually says about religion per se. You know, it doesn't say the United States is committed to serving God or recognizing the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but it actually says a lot of very useful things directly about religion besides other issues with regard to the principles of the Constitution being founded in Christian principles of government. But this is only a very narrow study. So there's only slight religion, uh, uh, mention of religion within any, any direct sense, but evidences of this uh, even slight recognition include recognition of, the, of uh, work on the Christian Sabbath as a day of rest, 
uh, when government work would not ensue. So we have actually stated in the Constitution, we don't, basically, we don't work on the Sabbath. And that's uh, in some particular provisions. Using Christian oaths of office, an oath, by the way, is a Christian concept. Uh, and it is an oath before God. That's why we swear before God when we take an oath, when you, uh, in a courtroom or et cetera, you swear before Almighty God. That's a Christian oath. It uh, was developed in the Middle Ages and it's reflected in our Constitution as well. Although they made an exception for Quakers and others who said we're not taking oaths. Uh, that's also in the Constitution. Now, uh, also the closing statement of the Constitution's uh, uh, proposal statement, and here we have the, the language in, it was, the Constitution was proposed in the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1,787, and of the independence of, of the United States of America, the 12th. So here we have a very clear recognition, and some people might say, well, you know, um, isn't that on most legal documents? Well, not stated like that. It's a very clear statement of a recognition of Jesus Christ, and if you understood more about the American founders, you would understand why that was included. You know, um, studies have shown that 51, perhaps 52 of the 55 signers of the, of the uh, Constitution were actually Orthodox Christians. Many of those were very much evangelical missionary sort of Christians, say like Patrick Henry, uh, lay preachers like Roger Sherman. And, uh, um, you know, these were Christian leaders in every sense of the term. Uh, but anyway, the First Amendment of the Constitution, of course, with its broad recognition of freedom of religion, was clearly founded on Christian principles of government, as revealed in discussions over the phrase. The consideration of the phrase was, we must have freedom of religion so that we can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we can have the opportunity to persuade men to believe. This is actually what Madison said, James Madison, the, uh, became president eventually of the United States, said in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in Virginia when he was promoting uh, this uh, concept in Virginia. But nevertheless, uh, the uh, prohibition on a national establishment of religion recognized the limited ability of government, especially at the national of gov uh, level, to create true faith in God. They understood that government couldn't do that, couldn't change men's hearts. Uh, and so government had a very limited role to play in that regard. Okay, another paper, The Scope and Limits of Majority Rule in Locke Rousseau and the Federalist Papers, presented in uh, Mississippi to Mississippi Political Science Association, February 2000. Well, here uh, I have, um, this is actually a quote from the paper, the Federalist insistence that government must be limited shows that they held with Locke, this is John Locke, the great English political philosopher, that there was an objective standard for determining the bounds of a just rule. It seems obvious that the Federalist was much more in the Lockean tradition than in the Rousseauian tradition. For uh, the Federalist uh, government or uh, majority rule was to protect freedoms of life, liberty, and property, not subjugate them to collective expressions of the general will, that's Rousseau. What can we conclude from these observations? First, we conclude that Rousseau is the odd man out in these discussions. For Locke and the American founders, the majority had power to create a government which protected an honest, private pursuit of life, liberty, and property. Rousseau instead posited the majority as a collective which subjugated private pursuits. Locke and the Americans relied on an external and transcendent source of authority behind the majority and therefore required limits on governmental power. Rupert so provided his uh, majority with absolute power to ensure a radically equal society. Locke and the American founders assumed that men were depraved to the extent that they required restraints on their exercise of political power. Rousseau believed that men were essentially good and could be reconstructed into one great collective mold. The progeny of Locke and the American framers is ever-increasing freedom, Rousseau's communist legacy is one of terror and oppression. While Locke and the writers of the Federalists did not, perhaps could not, propose a perfect system of government, it appears to be exceedingly better than the alternative. Another study, Essential Principles of Christian Political Thought, 
presented to Mississippi Political Science Association in 2001. Well, uh, a very brief summary of a much longer paper. The Bible presents man is made in the image and likeness of God. That's very central in the concept, Christian concepts of government. Because all men are created in the image and likeness of God, they each have value and dignity. Man's political rights flow from these concepts. Man's life and liberty are precious in the eyes of God. Therefore, men have a duty to work together to protect life, liberty, and property. Men also are given the task of exercising dominion under God over the created order. The Bible holds that men, however, are also fallen in sin, and as such, not consistently trustworthy or reliable. Thus, any conception of man in relation to government must take this into account. Fallen men are easily corrupted by power, and thus all power must be limited. Man primarily loves himself and his possessions rather than his fellow man or God. Man's problems at root are spiritual and no political policy can reform man's sinful nature. The Bible declares that God alone can change man's evil heart, producing goodness where otherwise evil reigns. Therefore, any utopian concept concerned with achieving a perfect society by political manipulation is flawed. Furthermore, man's selfish tendencies undermine any sort of group solidarity, war and strife flow from man's evil heart. Hence, man in the political sphere must not presume that he has the knowledge or ability to construct a just political order or a good society without God. The Bible portrays man's limitations and the frustrating realities of life in stark terms. The real politic of the Bible takes man in life as it is. The Bible warns men against empty dreams about past glories or future utopias. This life in a world cursed with sin will be filled with troubles and trials. In spite of this gloomy political forecast, all is not hopeless for man. The Bible claims that God has instituted just laws and principles by which men should live in personal dealings in the family, in the church, in the state, and all other spheres of life. The Bible explains that God has written the basic principles of his law on the hearts of all men and given to men the capacity of conscience to distinguish good and evil. This knowledge, however, does not ensure compliance versus Plato and Socrates. He also revealed his laws in detail in the scriptures. The Bible provides not only for right worship, but also for just dealings of men with men. Biblical ethics, as many commentators have noted, provide comprehensive guidelines for man's behavior. An understanding. <coughs> Christian political thought and the American founding. This is actually sort of an extension of the previous study to the American founders. Previous study looked at Christian principles, and then this study looked at the extent to which the American founders actually adopted these and followed them. The writers of the, uh, this is the section from the paper on human nature. The writers of the Federalists held that government must be based on popular consent in order to be considered legitimate because the people are the only legitimate fountain of power. But Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison held no illusions as to the essential goodness of man. The Federalist essays, indeed, were rather a matter of fact about both the depravity of human nature and the resulting failures of popular government through the course of human history. The Federalist authors used a technical theological term to describe the state of human nature. It had a horrible propensity to selfishness, pride, ambition, all of which were undermining to a stable political order. The reference to this concept in the Federalists are nothing less than remarkable. Among other things, the Federalists argued that man had a propensity to the dangerous vice of faction. Mankind had a propensity to fall into mutual animosities. Men were much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. Men had a propensity to condemn others and justify themselves. They had a propensity to strife that resulted in political dissension and disunion. Men had a propensity to yield to sudden and violent passions, being easily seduced. Men had a propensity to protect themselves at the sacrifice of their fellows. Men had a propensity to seek to promote themselves at the expense of the public good. Men in office had a propensity to take advantage of any top opportunity for political corruption. Can you imagine? The legislative body had a propensity to invade the rights of other branches, as well as to divide into factions, rather than uniting to uphold justice. If this were not bad enough, men were cruel, violent, avaricious, vain, and ungrateful. 
due to this wretched state of human nature, as the Federalists observed, human history displayed the seeming impossibility of mankind to cooperate. The history of factions, contentions, and disappointments may be classed among the most dark and degraded pictures which display the infirmities and depravities of the human character. This is why Madison declared it was only the grace of God that enabled production of the Constitution. Taking a note directly from James 4, Hamilton declared, to judge from the history of mankind, we should be compelled to conclude that the fiery and destructive passions of war reign in the human breast with much more powerful sway than the mild and beneficent sentiments of peace. The message of the Federalist is clear. The corruption of human nature was not institutional, it was constitutional. You couldn't just change structure of government and fix it. It was in man. Republican government, while just, offered no solution to the essential human condition. The problem was man. Are not the former republics administered by men, as well as the latter monarchies? Are not there uh, are not uh, aversions, predilections, rivalships, and desires of unjust acquisitions that affect nations as well as kings? Are not popular assemblies frequently uh, subject to the impulses of rage, resentment, jealousy, avarice, and other irregular and violent propensities? It is by no means surprising to hear Hamilton declare there's a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust. Even taken on a more positive note, man's propensity, if not corrupted, was to concern himself with his own family and private gain rather than the public good. The best the authors of the Federalists have to say about man was that he was not universally venal, damning with faint praise. Had some qualities which might motivate him, he had some qualities which might motivate him to seek the public good if he thought that this was also good for himself. He might defend his own turf and political office against competing branches and inadvertently contribute to the public good. And allowing for the ordinary depravity of human nature, few men of integrity could found, be found to hold the office of a judge who by the, by the nature of his post was to act impartially. No time to go on to that. We have to move on to another study. Democracy, Christianity, and Islam. This study uh, has shown that Christianity includes all the elements necessary to sustain democracy with regard to rule of law, recognition of rights, limited government, popular participation, and commitment to cooperation. Generally speaking, this has proven to be true in the history of majority Christian states. You know, we could actually see this in statistical data, comparing Christian nations and Muslim nations, and etc. With regard to Islam, its potential relation to democracy is more problematic. A facade of electoral democracy might be sustained, but true democracy with rule of law, recognition of rights, limited government, popular participation, and a commitment to cooperation is much more problematic. This examination of the teachings of Islam and the practice of Muslim-majority states on each of these elements has not yielded encouraging evidence. Neither the Muslim understanding of God nor their view of man lends itself to upholding the rule of law. Recognition of rights has some place in Islam and Muslim practice, but the fact that Islam also requires repression of unbelievers and women does not allow for consistent protection of rights. Islam provides some basis for limited government, but assigns too much responsibility to government in establishing Islam and punishing criticism of Islam. Popular, popular participation has some roots in Muslim ideology, but this is most often very limited and usually not open to non-Muslims. The Quran encourages a commitment to cooperation in civil society, yet this too has been very limited in practice and often does not include religious minorities. Should not be surprising then that the correlation of freedom when measured in majority Christian states versus majority Muslim states is practically opposite. It probably would not be an exaggeration to say that political freedom is in many ways a product of Christianity. This is a defensible proposition. It's an historic fact. Sadly, it might also be proper to conclude that political despotism is in large measure a product of Islam, or at the least, is not restrained by Islam. It's a 30-page paper, it's a lot more to it. Critique of the new Iraqi constitution. This is one of my sort of applications uh, now we know what is right, what government should be, what government should do. American founders got it pretty close. Why we threw that out the window when we basically wrote the Iraqi Constitution is 
something I can't answer. I mean, I do have some understanding of why our State Department ignores the truths that our American founders live by, and it's terribly unfortunate. But nevertheless, uh, after doing a thorough study on the Iraqi Constitution, this Constitution ratified on 15 October 2005 was, to some degree, a product of Paul Bremer's Coalition Provisional Authority Interim Government, ignoring the lessons of the Christian concepts of government that influenced the American founders, the Iraqi Constitution provided a weak and uncertain base for the future of Iraq. While also an Iraqi product, it was heavily influenced by U.S. advisors. It promotes Islam, requires the government to promote Islam, which always means subjugation of minorities, provides inadequate protection for individual rights, creates a weak, spineless executive, provides an ambiguous relationship between provinces or regions and the federal government, and create socialism while supposedly promoting capitalism. If this were not sufficiently bad, the entire Constitution is filled with contradictions that provide little basis for securing the rule of law. Again, a much longer study. Okay, let's see here. Did I get lost? There's a bit of something missing here. Uh, this is, this is, you're just seeing part of this slide, but anyway. Uh, this is from another paper. Let me try to uh, see. Um, I, yes, this is uh, from a paper I did on U.S. policy on terrorism. I'm sorry you don't see all of it, but nevertheless. Um, the, um, Understanding American founders was, and I'm quoting from some from a previous paper here, uh, that government was very limited in what it could accomplish. And one of the things that I make the point here is it certainly is a good thing that we are seeking to suppress terrorism all over the world because the ter terrorism is terrible, has no regard for human life and human rights. But on the other hand, uh, we should not use utopian language such as our goal is to end all terrorism and uh, you know, we're, we're going to go after terrorism wherever it exists anywhere in the world. That's not possible. And so it's one thing that uh, I'm remarking on here. And uh, Madison and Federalist 10 had made the statement that you know, if you uh, try to do anything completely, you're actually the more destruction, more unintended consequences than, than you would have thought. Uh, anyway, uh, that's the point I'm making here. It's Madison's observation that we will uh, not destroy st st all strife until we destroy all liberty, or rid ourselves of fire until we abolish air. It should be observed that we will not destroy terrorism until we destroy mankind. And this is because the root of terrorism is actually in man's heart. Hopefully such is not the end of the administration's declarations. Destroy all mankind, that is. Uh, while we cannot make men love one another by declaratory fiat, we can provide certain restraints to the evil actions of men. And these restraints are efficient to some degree if they are swift and consistent. But when terrorists fear neither death nor punishment, law ceases to be an effective restraint. Promotion of an ethic of materialism also provides little motivation for real transformation. In other words, you can say, well, they're terrorists because they're poor, and if we can promote capitalism, they'll be rich, and therefore they won't be terrorists anymore. That's actually not a sound basis for dealing with terrorism. Uh, and uh, it was perhaps too much uh, promoted by the Bush administration. Pro uh, will, will the U.S. promote a hollow ethic of postmodernism that is no absolutes? perhaps the Obama administration, along with its desire to remake the world. It will not work. It used to be said of the British that the missionary goes with a flag. It's not to excuse any abuses of the British. Uh, a religion that teaches that God himself died for the sins of men provides the best hope for radical transformation of humanity. The commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is good for all. And that should actually be something we take into account when we're dealing with terrorism. Okay. Now, free trade and morality. I also have done a 
a good work in economics, in, as well as my work in constitutional issues. And I presented this at the Hillsdale College Free Market Forum in Michigan. And I'm going to read from a bit of this. When God created man, he gave him a duty to multiply and fill the earth and to subdue and exercise dominion over it. Throughout the scriptures, the duty of man to work, progress, and prosper is a constant theme. Six days shall you labor. The scripture commends skill and labor and promises prosperity to the diligent. Also, many biblical passages praise increasing efficiency through trade and commerce. Generally speaking, God blesses honest labor and trade with prosperity. It is God, not Adam Smith's invisible hand, who makes free markets work. However, there's also a caveat, the scriptures repeat, while men are busy with their daily labors, they must not neglect love for God and man. Allowing liberty to fulfill these dominion duties while disallowing license is always a difficult challenge. The free market, rightly understood, is a system that allows men to exercise their God-given duty to progress and prosper. Unfortunately, the market can also become a means of promoting license instead of liberty, can allow exchange of immoral and harmful goods, inclusion, include collusion of government to gain uh, with government to gain advantage and oppress, and become an idol that replaces love for God and man. It is not free trade, but immorality, covetousness, idolatry, fraud, oppression, and slavery that God condemns. These abuses are not a failure of the market, they are a failure of man. Christians should not be ambivalent about a free market. Certainly they should not assume a free market is inherently oppressive. We should not approach the market as inherently flawed, requiring government planning programs and regulations to fix market failures, Instead, the concern should be with moral freedom and moral responsibility in market exchange. The scripture approaches freedom as a moral value. Men have liberty from God to do that which is just and right, but they do not have the right to do that which is harmful, wrong, or immoral. In order for men to exercise liberty but not license, they must be governed by a moral standard, and of course that would be the biblical standard. Uh, the biblical concept of civil justice. Another study. I uh, presented in 2010. The uh, biblical system of civil justice emphasizes equality, easy access to courts, due process of law, proportionate swift, and sure punishments, and limits on the power and role of civil government. It stresses the necessity of government officials being proactive in securing the personal and property rights of the poor and disabled. It provides for a restorative system of justice for property crimes that easily trumps the commonly practiced and ineffective prison system. The biblical system of justice far surpassed that of the nation surrounding Israel when it was set forth in the biblical text. What great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as just as this whole law, which I set before you today? Quoting Moses from Deuteronomy. In many ways, it still surpasses systems of justice today. Another study. Oh, I'm missing part of it too. Sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, this is uh, a biblical system of justice. This is the study. And uh, here we have um, the, uh, a few things that I've quoted here. Uh, okay, let me see if I can actually... Okay. Uh, no, I can't see more of it on the page. But nevertheless, that's not too much of a problem. Um, all right, so uh, what do we have? Uh, a biblical system of justice, uh, and they have the American founders viewed uh, justice. I think I want to actually, I'm going to uh, pull out of this and go to where we can actually see that uh, in its entirety. And so let me click on this and go up. Okay, the concept of justice in the American founding period. The, uh, <clears throat> I, I could take time to change it where you could see it, it was working fine, but you can still see it. Okay, uh, the protection of private property was widely considered to be one of the first objects of government and essential component of justice. Any idea that property could be violated besides minimal taxation by consent for the general good was abhorrent to the founders. Thomas Jefferson stated, to take from one, you'll see why I'm wanting, very much wanting to see this in full, to take from one because it is thought his own industry uh, and that of his father has acquired too much. 
in order to spare to others is to violate arbitrarily the first principle of association. To take from one because you think he's worked too hard and made too much money to give to someone else is to violate the principles of human association. It's actually what Bastiat in the law just declared to be legal plunder. It's actually theft, even if government requires it. Let's see, also we have John Adams, likewise held, property is surely a right of mankind as really as liberty. If it were not securely protected, considered to be as sacred as the laws of God, and were forcefully redistributed, debts would be abolished first, taxes laid heavy on the rich, and not on all the others, and at last a downright equal provision, division of everything to be demanded and voted. The idle, the vicious, the intemperate would rush into the utmost extravagance of debauchery. If thou shalt not covet and thou shalt not steal were not commandments of heaven, they must be made in viable precepts in every society before it can be civilized or made free. These guys, when I say they were following Christian principles of government, it wasn't just sort of they picked it up somewhere. It wasn't just accidental. They were actually directly following biblical teaching. The way in which charity was addressed to the Bible, as well as the consensus of political thought, left it beyond, left it, the practice of charity, beyond the reach of government, thus provided no foundation for a philosophy of social justice administered through government social welfare programs, redistribution of wealth, or even graduated income tax. This does not mean that charity was not an important function for man. It was, but the duty to charity was personal. This approach to charity also took into account the necessity of personal responsibility, that is, for work, as prescribed by God to man. In other words, as we have heard, he who does not work shall not eat. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, get this to uh, pull it back up here. And let me switch back to this. Here we go. I can move my... <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, maybe that is kind of messing me up. It's it, that's irrelevant, I think, to what we're doing here. But anyway, let's see if we can do it this way. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, I just have to uh, click along a bit here. Uh, concept of liberty in the American family. The last study was concept of justice in the American family. This one's concept of liberty. According to the founders and the sources on which they rely, liberty proceeds from God. It provides the opportunity for men to pursue that which benefits and protects life and enables man to develop his interest and in industry to acquire property. But it always must be constrained by law or it become license. They very sharply distinguish between these as was the, the as is stated in the scriptures and was the principle of all Christian political theorists. God blesses those who use liberty property, and this brings great blessings to both men and nations. But those who abuse the liberty they possess as a gift from God enslave themselves to vice and become, can become the slaves of men. Government comes into the picture as a mechanism that can protect and secure liberty. Since man, each man, has this gift of liberty from God, there can be no arbitrary constraint on liberty. Each man must willingly give his consent to such public constraints as will enlarge and protect the sphere of liberty uh, in, in which he can exercise his liberties. While the concern of the American founding may have shifted to detailing a structure of government that would secure liberty and restrain its abuses, there seems little dispute about the fundamental concepts of liberty. Okay, another study from uh, 2012. We're actually getting close to the end. The meaning of liberty in Supreme Court decisions compared with the views of the American founders. The 14th Amendment protected the privileges and immunities of citizens from abridgment by the states. 
This language, which included a clear definition and known rights, has largely been ignored by the Supreme Court. The 14th Amendment also declared that states could not deprive any of its citizens, including the newly freed blacks, of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This provision meant just what it had meant in the Fifth Amendment and the English precedents going back to Magna Carta. Citizens could not be seized and punished or imprisoned unless they were found to have broken laws in a judicial proceeding. It would behoove the court to return to a jurisprudence concerned with protecting clearly known privileges and immunities of citizens and ensuring that everyone gets a fair shake in court criminal proceedings. Beyond these provisions, the court is not competent to go. And if you know what all the court has done with privileges and immunities of citizens and other language of the 14th Amendment, you'll know how significant that claim is that I'm making. Liberty in its proper bounds, the privileges and immunities of citizens. A subsequent study. The Supreme Court has often made no pretense of needing to follow any intended meaning of the 14th Amendment. In fact, in Lawrence v. Texas, promoting homosexuality, the court mocked the framers of the 14th Amendment in declaring that if they had realized what the court would read into the 14th, they might have been more specific on what it meant. Had those who drew and ratified the due process clauses of the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment <laughs> known the components of liberty and its manifold possibilities, they might have been more specific. That's quoting from the court. Instead, then, of looking to the text of the Constitution or the intent of the framers of the Fourteenth Amendment, the court declared its right to redefine liberty however it chose. Citing Casey's curious mystery of life dictum. That's another court case. Planned Parenthood versus Casey. We have just suffered through the painful argument of the Solicitor General, this was written last summer, to defend the Affordable Care Act, summer of 2012. Um, even experienced observers of the court and experts in constitutional law could not predict how the court would rule. No one knew. How could you not predict how the highest court in the land would rule on a critical matter of law. Why could you not predict? Because they are unpredictable. <coughs> That's the opposite of what we call the rule of law. Even experienced observers of the court and experts in constitutional law could not predict how the court would rule. Why not? Not because the Constitution is not clear on the reach of federal commerce powers, but because no one could predict what the court might find to impose upon the Constitution. This is not the rule of law, it's a rule of judicial fiat, the opposite of law. It is the exercise of judicial will instead of judicial judgment, which is another important phrase that was directly opposed to what the founders intended. This is equally the problem with 14th Amendment jurisprudence. The language, intent, and evil to be prevented was actually clear with the adoption of the 14th Amendment. But between the greed of Americans for the right to sue of every supposed slight and the seemingly unlimited ability of the legal profession to find ways to help them do so, and a Supreme Court that is entirely unpredictable, the 14th Amendment has been tossed, pillaged, and burned by the courts. It has seldom been used for its intended purposes. More recent. Study, the revival of just four principles in academic literature and declarations of George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations. Just war theory largely based on Christian principles with regard to the decision to go to war justifies war only in a narrow set of circumstances such as countering acts of aggression to punish evildoers and to deliver masses from genocide. Also, it only allows such intervention with right intention. It requires the decisions to go to war to be made by legitimate authorities. It requires proportional considerations, both in terms of measured response to the offense and a cost-benefit analysis of the acts of war. It requires that war be made with those who are actually, actually responsible for the offense and those engaged in combat and not non-combatants. It requires consideration of all alternatives to avoid war and prosecuting war as a last resort. And it requires a reasonable hope of success. Also, its goals must always be to restore peace and order. Within the war, just war requires discrimination and proportion, including protecting civilians. 
and after the war, just war requires a just peace and restoration. This study will consider, the study did consider, several of these principles as reflected in the war language of Presidents Bush and Obama. And that's sort of the introduction, and then I just give a brief bit of the conclusion. Were the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the broad war on terrorism justified by just war principles? Clearly, this is Christian just war principles, by the way. Clearly, the Bush administration claimed that they were, and the Obama administration has argued similarly for the war in Afghanistan and the ongoing war against Al-Qaeda. At a minimum, just war theory requires a serious consideration of many issues before war is commenced and it brings restraints to actions in war. The reliance of both administrations on just war theory is a positive affirmation of the ongoing usefulness of moral considerations, and we might say Christian moral considerations, and going to war, carrying on war, and an ending war. The end. <laughs> Uh, we probably could take a minute if anyone has any questions or comments. Yes. Uh, in light of the discussion on Jefferson with the uh, Human Association, sure. How did uh, the tax system evolve? If that was a prevailing thought then, would a flat tax have been more appropriate and more fair, and not violation of that? Or what? Out of what did the the tax system then come out if that was a prevailing cause? Well, among other things, uh, back to the American founders, the uh, biblical principles which had been incorporated into the common law of England by Alfred the Great. Literally, he took scriptures directly from Leviticus and Deuteronomy and put them into the English law system. Among other things, uh, the, sort of the central principle he took from Leviticus 19 is that treatment of all individuals by government had to be equal. Uh, you could not treat the rich differently than the poor, and that would apply as well to taxation. So uh, not treating everyone equally uh, on an equal standard, so it would require a flat tax, an equal tax uh, on everyone, or an equal excise tax on everything, et cetera, et cetera. So they understood that as a biblical principle. Uh, and uh, they're reflecting, you know, that anything else is theft. In their day, uh, the uh, popular socialist writer besides Plato was uh, Saint Simon in France, and uh, to some extent Rousseau. And they completely rejected those arguments as being a violation of uh, all the laws of God and morality. And uh, they wrote into the Constitution actually very limited uh, uh, ability of the federal government, for example, to tax. And the taxes actually stated in the Constitution had to be uniform throughout the United States. So they actually had to be flat, had to be even and uh, the same throughout the United States. Because of that, in 1895, in uh, Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust Company, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down uh, a, a, an income tax. Uh, which uh, charged different people different things, a slightly graduated income tax, struck it down as actually violating the Constitution. But the American people, uh, you know, Karl Marx's writings were actually quite popular at the time in America. We had a communist run for president in 1920 and actually get about 20% of the vote. <clears throat> the Communist Party was, uh, and socialist parties were popular throughout the United States. Uh, the, uh, you had a progressive revolution that adopted, uh, to some extent, socialist and communist ideas in many ways, including the idea of promoting a graduated income tax, which was at the center of Marxist Communist Manifesto. That's the first step you do to move an economy from uh, capitalism, free market capitalism, uh, into uh, socialist communism, is to create a graduated income tax where you take the money away from the rich and give it to the poor. Uh, and so those ideas were actually quite popular in the United States and uh, promoted by, uh, you know, leading politicians. And uh, that got us the 16th Amendment to the Constitution that allowed for the collection of an income tax without it, without it being distributed uniformly throughout the United States. And uh, although uh, it was promoted as, you know, uh, there would, it would never go very high because even in Wartime, they actually collected uh, an income tax illegally during the Civil War. It only went up to 10%. So in peacetime, it'll never go above 3%. So when it was sold to the American people, can you imagine 
selling a politician selling one thing when it actually is something else that you're buying as a policy. Can you imagine that occurring? Uh, but anyway, so uh, very soon after uh, we had the 16th Amendment in place, they created graduated income taxes. Uh, we got into World War I. The uh, rates went through the roof uh, and uh, were brought down. It was one of the factors actually leading to the Great Depression. Uh, and uh, then in World War II, the Roosevelt administration actually took the highest rate of taxes on the highest graduated graduated rate, you know, beyond a certain level, up to 90, 95%. Beyond that certain level, you paid 95% to the federal government. Too bad, I suppose, that the state was charging you 10%. You'd have to come up with extra money. Uh, but but uh, so how did we get there? It was through neglect of the Christian principles that the founders understood and followed, and it was adopting a a, a foreign system, a communist system promoted by Karl Marx and others, uh, and uh, eventually sort of worked its way its way into American policy. Yes. So we're evaluating whether our current government is consistent. With Christian principles yeah. as laid out by the founders. Right. Do you believe that all three branches of government have gone off the rails at similar points in history, or is one leading the charge more and the other is sort of trying to stand back the tide? It has varied throughout American history. You know, um, changes have been, I suppose you would say, at times promoted by politicians and uh, perhaps even, you know, uh, demanded by the American populace. You know, when you start telling people, uh, if we raise taxes on the rich and, and give you their money, uh, would that be a policy you would vote me in office to support? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people have voted for such a thing, even though, of course, it's a violation of biblical concepts. And it would be, you know, I suppose you could use the term, it would make the American founders turn over in their grave, because it's the opposite of what they wanted to establish. Uh, it's a very sad thing. And, uh, of course, it burns itself out. You know, uh, it's been millennia that we've known that if you create a democratic system and the people figure out that, um, they have the right to, as a majority, to take money away from everybody else and give it to themselves. That That's sort of the beginning of the end for any political system. Anything else? Well, as you see, uh, I, I've only given you a tidbit. Uh, one of my uh, former students is here, and he's gotten a lot more of this uh, through the years. But uh, I've only given you just a little sampling of what we, uh, what the things that I write about. I don't just spend all my political science classes, you know, going through this. Uh, we have a lot of uh, skills you have to learn in political science uh, and, and understand about, you know, presidency and judiciary and et cetera that we actually study. But uh, I do bring these things into play uh, as they are relevant. But these are my writings. These are the works that I do in addition to my teaching at Bellhaven. And I uh, very much thank you for your attention.